Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Lee Montville and I'm the Director of Special Sales at Springer Publishing. Today we are presenting key challenges facing today's school nurse, making certain that every child counts in the 2023-2024 school year with Janice Lashavo, an adjunct instructor in William Patterson University's Graduate Nursing Division. Janice has over 26 years of experience as a school nurse before retiring from that position in 2007. She is also a Springer author of two, two of our books, Fast Facts for the School Nurse and School Nursing. You'll see information about those books later on. Thank you also to our partners at School Nurse Supply for their support today. And for all of you who have joined today, please stay tuned until the end of the webinar for a special offer from School Nurse Supply. In addition, we will be sending out information about our about your certificate of attendance for all those who have attended today's webinar. Before we get started, I wanted to mention that this webinar will be recorded. And if you miss any portion of the presentation, you can find the video on Springer Publishing's website five to seven days post event. If you have any questions, we ask that you please type them into your Q&A box on your Zoom control panel. Now, without further ado, we will turn the time over to Janice. Thank you, Lee. Thank you for the lovely words. Um, I'd also like to thank Gina Martinez for her wonderful help with the technology and realizing there's almost 800 of you registered. That's quite a task there. I also need to send a big thank you to John Zay for my, my fabulous editor who held my hands through the fourth edition publication. Um, he really is, uh, he somehow found the, um, the common element that we needed with school nursing, and he was just just marvelous. And of course, I thank Deanna from School Nurse Supply for their continued support. So now, hello to all of you. Thank you for joining us today. I send a special shout out to my many former and current students, um, and thank um, for allowing me this this privilege of presenting to you today. Know that, that I am well aware of the value of your time, so I promise to be concise as we delve into the needs of children. This workshop will be interactive, so please at this point have a pen ready and a few pieces of paper. Uh, we will invite you a little bit later on to uh, enter your ideas and questions in the chat box. Uh, I am certain we will not get to all of the questions, but I do promise to get back to you at a later date. My goal is to raise awareness of the needs of children and bring you up to date on a number of issues and how we can effectively apply our skills and better prepare for this new, very challenging school year. Let us remember that you are the one constant in the child's educational experience. Teachers come and go. Administrators, well, they usually just get involved if there's a problem. So let's take a look at the important role you play in the lives of children. And always remember, for some children, you are all they have. Okay, I have to share, um, originally this workshop I had wanted to call as the Say a Child, and John, the, uh, my editor, said, I don't think that's a good idea. Children are not inherently sad. They, um, they're happy, it's adults that make them sad. Of course he's right. And then I had titled it The Changing Paradigm. But then when I thought about that, uh, even though much of our role has changed, what is constant is the need, though, to help children be healthy so they can learn and achieve their best level of academic success. A student's ability to learn is tied directly to their physical and mental health. We know a sad, lost child simply cannot learn. So, today's school nurse plays a vital role in the front lines of public health. COVID taught us that. So, in other words, we're doing a lot, but we need to do more. We must not only keep children healthy, but we have to make them happy as well. To do that, we need to identify those areas of concern 
and focus on the ways to provide all students a safe refuge and a supportive environment. Please note, I make it perfectly clear I'm not an expert, um, but I do offer school nurse perspectives and will reference information from those who are references, oh, who are experts. I've included those references on my last slide. I do, however, consider myself, like you, my colleagues, knowledgeable on the behavioral manifestations of children in school, especially the child that's in pain. Yes, identifying helping these children is indeed a tremendous challenge for us. I love these pictures and I am so excited to share them with you. The picture on the left was taken around 1923. The one on the right is from 2020, approximately 100 years later. Well, education has dramatically changed in almost 100 years. Remember that national mandatory school attendance did not begin until the early 1900s. Prior to that, families that could afford tutors would educate their children, but the vast majority of children had no formal education. On the left, if you look closely, you'll see those children were all taught the same, but over time it became clear that not all children, even if they were the same age, enjoyed the same level of wellness and therefore didn't learn the same. Difference were apparent. Therefore, instruction started to change as well. In today's classroom on the right, we know that approximately 20% or five out of the 20 in an average class will have some type of academic, medical, emotional need and require an accommodation. And this became law in 1973 with the passage of the Individual with Disabilities Act. We now have placed children in the, le in the mainstream in the least restrictive environment. And I know you have heard those words. So let's take a closer look at each picture. On the left side there, these children are seated in their neat little rows. If you look at their faces, they appear either frightened or stoic. Um, where the class on the right, they're seated in pairs. The girl with the white sweat shirt on with her hand raised is seated next to a boy who's not in his seat. Perhaps he just can't sit still and attend. Uh, the teacher, I, I like to think, wisely placed them in the back of the room where he's not a distraction to other children by moving about and next to a little girl who's saving, serving as a role model because we know today the children learn from each other. So let's take a look at these children that are a little different, that do not fit neatly into the mainstream. They're marginalized, they're misunderstood, so we can develop some other strategies to help them. Yes, today's world is absolutely different, but if we do not change in concert with the needs of today's students, the today's school age child will no, be no better off than the student in the early 1900s. Objectives here, our task is to look closely at where we are today and start with the bigger picture. What areas challenge students' learning? How can we address these issues so academic performance improves? And then we'll take a look at these issues and place them in the context of the current school year so we can plan accordingly for the many challenges the new year will bring us. What does it mean to be marginalized? Well, simply put, this is a child who just does not fit into the mainstream. They remain on the peripheral edge of society. In other words, they're a social isolate. This is why we need to take a look at them. Why are people marginalized? Well. There's a variety of reasons. They, they may just be poor. They cannot afford to keep up with the Joneses. They may behave in a socially unacceptable manner. They could be stigmatized by special needs. And I hear repeatedly, these are the children that it's hard to be their friend. Um, there may be gender issues involved and other children don't want to be stigmatized. Or they may live a transient lifestyle. If they move around every week, every month, Every school year, they never establish friendships and roots. Now, I'd like to take a moment here. Um, who is this misunderstood child? Um, if you don't mind, I will read these to you because um, uh, 
there were a whole, there were many more, and I, I compressed them into two, but they're, they're hard felt and they're, they're worth listening to. Who is this misunderstood child? I'm the child that looks healthy and fine. I was born with 10 fingers and toes, but something is different somewhere in my mind, and what it is, nobody knows. I'm the child that can't catch the ball and runs with an awkward gait. I'm the one chosen last on the team, and I cringe as I stand there and wait. I'm the child with whom no one will play, the one that gets bullied and teased. I try to fit in. I want to be liked, but nothing I do seems to please. I'm the child with a broken heart. Though I act like I really don't care, perhaps there's a reason God made me this way, some message God sent me to share. For I am the child that needs to be loved and accepted and valued too. I'm the child that's misunderstood. I'm different, but I look just like you. It's by Kathy Winters. Please, when you can, read it. It's in entirety. And she makes a beautiful point that um, the child looks normal. If the child looks normal, why can't they behave more normal? We seem to have done very well with the physically handicapped children, but other handicaps, we just are not as um, understanding. Okay, why are they misunderstood? Well, variety of reasons here, and again, I've narrowed it down. These are taken from Jan Hunt, who say, who says children behave as well as they are treated. Why statement there? We expect children to be able to do things before they're ready. In other words, we ask them to stop being a child. Perhaps that child is just not developmentally ready to sit and wait his turn, or they don't have the awareness or the vocabulary to express their feelings. We become angry when the child's failed to meet our needs. It's not the kid's problem if you need to take that phone call in your office and, and they want your attention. It's not their problem if you, um, if you have to finish your screenings in a certain amount of time. Children are children. We somehow forget that and we forget what it was like ourselves. A normal, healthy child is noisy, emotionally expressive, and has a short attention span. Our behavior provides the most potent lessons. It's truly not what we say, but what we do that the child takes to heart. When a child's behavior disappoints us, we should, more than anything else we do, assume the best. If we always assume the best about, about the child, the child will be free to do his best. And please remind teachers and administrators of these things too. Sometimes consequences are far too harsh and the they consequences must be handled, must be done, but uh, they should be reasonable and age appropriate. So I need your help here, everyone. Um, what, what do you consider the major issues that affect children's ability to learn? On that piece of paper I used you to have handy, list just a couple of things that pop into your mind. Uh, and bear in mind, too, the schoolyard extends well beyond what we formerly knew into the community. Uh, schools are a microcosm of the outside world. So what goes on in the, in the community will surface in the schools and impact students. Um, so think about this, and I will share with you what I have identified. Violence, I mean, we know it's on the outside. And again, if it's in the community, it's going to trickle into the school. Um, uh, LBGTQ discrimination, substance abuse, HIP, int intimidation, ha harassment, intimidation, bullying, poverty, politics, cultural, racial bias, mental illness, transient lifestyle, autism, special needs, unstable home life, and many single parent homes we have children that are being raised by just a mother or a dad um, because there's divorce involved or they never marry to begin with. And then there's parental peer pressure. On my next slide here, I, I'm asking you just to respond inside of the chat box for me. And just a few of the issues that you feel are of greatest significance for children. And I'm going to ask my buddy Lee if he would just share as they come in a couple. I need to see what's on your mind, and we certainly want to know for future um, workshops as well. What are the what are the issues that impact the child's behavior in the school? Thanks, Janice. Yeah, the, so there are tons and tons coming in. Definitely, oh. social media, cyberbullying, social media exposure, lack of parental supervision, okay. food insecurity, hunger, language barrier. Um, 
access to healthy food, poverty, lack of parental involvement, racism, okay. lack of respect. Folks, okay. see. There's excellent good coming in. Mental health issues as well. Okay. All right. Then we're on target here today. Thank you, Lee. Please know I'm going to review all of these at a later date. And um, I, I find it fascinating. Excellent. So what happens to the child now? What happens to that child who is already suffering from any one of those issues? What is the impact on them? Well, we know antidepressants are all over the place, especially with young high school girls. Anxiety disorders are, are proliferating all over the place. Children are becoming much more, uh, at a younger age, sexually promiscuous. Substance abuse, we'll talk about that later. Obesity, morbid obesity has immediate and long-term effects. Violence in schools to itself and others. And I need to share just a very um, quick um, research study that I read taken from the Self-Harm Institute, 2022. 17% of all will self-harm in a lifetime, predominantly girls, and this is mostly cutting. Apparently, these girls cannot handle the emotional stress, and by cutting, they deal with the physical, and the physical they can handle, but the emotional stress they cannot. So I think that statistics are appalling, and I want you to know I, I thought it was um, inflated, so I went to other sources, and those numbers are supported by them. So be aware of that. Um, academic problems, children that bring home failing report cards, or they just stay out of school. Parental pressure, which causes terrible rebellion and unrest in the home. And social media. They rely on the social media for comfort. And low self-esteem. We have an obligation to, to do whatever we can to help children establish uh, high self-esteem. Okay, I'm going to mention just a few comments and some statistics to put a few of these issues into perspective. As you know, we process information differently in our brains. The brain cells present at birth, but are, most are dormant and they fire as you mature. It does not fully develop until our early 20s. And Dr. Brenda Marshall did an excellent chapter in our book, um, Essential References on Mental Health Disorders. Anxiety, Attention Deficit, Autism, and Mood Disorders she placed at the top. I also would like to point out in that same textbook, um, Dr. Hugh Basis did an, um, uh, an analysis of the um, uh, neurological anatomy of the brain of the special needs child. I did not understand that myself until he, he did this for me. I'm trying to get my cursor in the right place. Okay, he, these are uh, statistics taken from Dr. Brenda Marshall. Horrible, as you can see. Almost 10% of our children have um, ADHD, anxiety disorders, behavioral problems. And don't be too happy about depression that it's only 4.4. That is on the rise. Um, so this is not something to be excited about. And she also points out that roughly 22% of American children have a psychiatric disorder. This is more than um, cancer, diabetes, HIV together, making it the, the most common disease category of children. Again, very scary. Okay, autism spectrum disorder. Spectrum disorder, let's remember, please, that a spectrum disorder means that there are a number of characteristics that are common for the entire disease, the entire entity. With autism spectrum, it's uh, communication, interaction, repetitive behaviors and interests. It's much more common in boys than girls, and it affects all racial, social, and ethnic groups uh, equally. We did change the name in 2013 from autism to autism spectrum disorder, and it now includes pervasive developmental disorder, which um, increased the umbrella and cover, it covers more entities now. So now roughly about one in six children, age three to 17, were diagnosed with a developmental dis disability. I need to throw in here Dr. Wakefield's study. Some of you may have heard it. This was done way back in, in 1998. But there's remnants out there about it. This was the study that um, where they compared children that were already diagnosed with autism, approximately 12, which is really not much of a study group, 
but um, a large number of them who had recently had an MMR vaccine. There's not a lot of credence given to this study. If any of you find out um, anything to the contrary, I'm very happy to, to listen. But right now, I don't see a lot of credence to that study. Uh, they never did a control with students that were not um, that were not uh, given the MMR vaccine. Um, it is a treatable uh, oh, substance abuse. Oh, darn it, I wanted to introduce this differently to you. I wanted to ask, what is the United States' longest yet to be one war. And it, of course, it's the war on drugs. Um, we hopelessly beg our children just to say no, yet millions of Americans have been sent to jail for violating drug laws. Um, we have seen thousands die from overdoses. And again, I don't have recent statistics on Narcan. I'm so hoping that it has decreased. Um, what we have to remember is that young brain, and remember we said earlier that it's um, developing into their 20s, so their early 20s, the young brain is highly susceptible to drug influence. And I've heard of cases with one dose of fentanyl or uh, an opioid, they can become addicted. And sadly, young children, uh, they're athletics, they're, they're athletes, so they have injuries involving bones with a terribly painful. They also have dental work. Many of them have wisdom teeth that have to be removed. These require strong, strong pain medicine. This is how they become addictive. Physicians have been cautioned now. They only prescribe a limited number, and they're supposed to be discussing addiction with parents when they do prescribe it, but it's still a concern. And right now, uh, for, I think this is from the CDC, persons aged 12 years and older have used an illegal drug in the past month, or roughly 13%. Very scary. Okay. What's going on today? Vaping, we're hearing so much about that, and that's a concern because of the additives that are placed inside the uh, e-cigarettes. We know they go to their medicine cabinet now for opioids, and alcohol and marijuana are still considered gateway drugs into much more abusive um, medications. You might ask yourself, why is the war on drugs so difficult to win? Well, different drugs have become popular with different generations. In other words, the enemies keep changing. Before 1800, we did not recognize the addictive properties of plant-based products. So opium, from opium came alkaloids such as morphine, cocaine, heroin. And then somewhere in there, in the 1800s, we developed the syringe. I had no idea this had a major impact because now drugs could be delivered immediately and a high was much, much better. Um, by uh, the six, 1960s, we started with recreational drugs, cocaine, LSD, marijuana. The 80s brought us crack, which is a highly addictive form of cocaine. The 90s, crystal methamphetamine. And then now we're dealing with the opioid epidemic, and many feel that this is the absolute worst. Um, it remains a major health issue, and um, nicotine also contributes, uh, is considered a gateway drug. The, these statistics are from the CDC. Approximately 15% of high school students reported ever having used a select illicit injectable drug. Scary. 14% of students report misusing prescription drugs, and the age range was 13 to 17. Okay, LBGTQ discrimination. LBGTQ is uh, an acronym for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, or questioning. And then added a little plus on there that uh, that stands for the um, other areas of sexuality. Right now, 7.1% of Americans identify as something other than heterosexual. Again, this is, I believe, CDC. 1.4, uh, uh, 13 years and up, identify as trans, and 4% identify as bisexual. We have a brand new... Um, vocabulary. Uh, sex and gender are not one and the same. Uh, sex is determined and by genitals at birth. If there's a little penis there when the baby's delivered, it's a boy. If it's a vulva, it's a girl. Uh, gender, however, is the personal sense of who you are. And that, they say, develops around two or three years old. The children know at that point. Uh, bisexual, sexually attracted to both men and women. Gay is attracted to one's own sex. Uh, lesbian is a homosexual woman or girl. 
uh, transgender as the sex assigned at birth differs from that, that they were um, from the way the person identifies. Gender norms are characteristics, behaviors, relationships society has constructed for us. Boys play with trucks, girls play with dolls, pink, blue, all of that. Intersex, that's a new word for hermaphrodites. Um, that, that's a person with male and female organs or characteristics. And the orientation is how one identifies in relation to sexual attraction. Binary is the belief that um, uh, there are just two sexes, male and female. There is now another theory that gender is non-binary. In other words, sex does not fit some sex. Some people are assigned a sex that does not fit strictly male or female. The person could change how they identify. They become um, uh, gender fluid, another new term. Uh, and the distinction clearly is not defined as either male or female. Okay, so with all these issues, what are the barriers? What are the barriers for us to deal with as educators? Um, there are a lot of gray areas of what we do. I'm not telling you anything that you're not already aware of. And our jobs are very hard for that reason. Um, there are um, there are so many of us that have personal beliefs and religious uh, that our feelings are based on religious background. This is the way we were raised. We find it hard to balance all of these regulations with our workload and stigma that might be attached and conflicts. Not only the parents, administrators. Other school nurses, even, um, uh, nobody wants to fight. Nobody wants to, everybody wants to be liked. And student standards, the le student learning standards that are coming down the pike that many districts are, are having difficulty handling. And the right to privacy. Many object to the rules that we cannot share with parents about certain things. So we'll talk a little about each one of these things. These are the areas that um, are concerned. If you open the newspaper, these are the things that we're looking at. The standards, post-pandemic perspectives, what's going to happen with respiratory issues coming down the pipe here, immunization, and emergency management in schools, um, the violence that we're, we're hearing about. Okay, student learning standards. Okay, that's not a misprint there. The 10th Amendment, 1791. The 10th Amendment to the Constitution. This is our Bill of Rights, and it goes back that far. It clarifies that all matters, unless specifically delegated to the federal government, are to be left to the states. In other words, um, the federal government handles the army, our military, and uh, currency, printing money. Uh, the state cannot touch that. However, all other matters, and education is other matters. This is left up to the state. This assured our founding fathers that we would not have a central government that was too strong and too powerful, and they strongly believed that the power belonged to the states or to the people. So this is what guides our educational process. They, we have models, national, international, but the standards are specific to the state. And we do rely on research from other areas, but there's a great influence to the media, political pressure, prominent people coming out, and a force now behind our LGBT groups. Standards, again, they're written guidelines for districts. The teacher takes the standard, adapts it to the needs of her children, bear, to her students. Bear in mind that we have standards for all the disciplines, math, science, music, art, all of them. And then from there, the states and the local municipalities determine what the educational curricula are and the material to be used, and it totally is in the hands of that municipality. Now, uh, why is it a concern now? Well, as we said, greater political pressure here, and um, there is a concerted effort underway to pressure some local districts to reduce or even abandon essential policies that protect, provide a supportive environment for LGBTQ students. Bear in mind, we protect all students, all students that are in the minority or are marginalized. So what, what can you do here? My suggestion, know what the needs of your students are and see that your health curriculum is in sync with these needs. 
To do that, you need to write curriculum. You need to be on that committee to update your, your family life, your health education curriculum. And as disputes erupt, stay informed. Don't hide. Hang in there. Okay. Post-pandemic perspectives. Okay. I could not resist sharing this beautiful iceberg image. When I did webinars during the height of COVID, um, I referenced these images all the time, which to me represent the seen, the unseen, and the unforeseen. When you look at that iceberg on the left, you'll see the tip of the iceberg, which is a smaller area. I, I need to point out too, if you look closely, and I don't know if you could see my cursor, over here, there's a little darkened area. That is a cruise ship, just so you can get the, the uh, idea of the scope of the problem. So the tip of the iceberg is the scene. That's what we saw, people getting sick, uh, rushing out to buy our test kits and um, uh, hospitalization. Below the surface was the unseen, which was what we never, never anticipated. Uh, the uh, air, air travel eliminated, uh, schools closing, businesses closing. One million uh, as of now, uh, as of 2000, August of 23, one million, 127 deaths and um, many, many more cases of COVID. And that's the World Health Organization. The image on the right is the iceberg as it breaks apart and evolves and prevents presents different variants. As predicted, this is where we are now. Okay, which takes us into respiratory concerns. I heard a wonderful lecture by Dr. Sanjay Gupta. Uh, he's with the CDC. He cautions us to prepare for an increase in respiratory illnesses. So as temperatures rise and we gather indoors during the cold season, we can expect that COVID, we will have additional tests now, additional cases. We are starting to see them. Um, and this is even without the wealth of information coming from home testing. Uh, right now, we're not testing as often as we had in the past, of course, but they test all way, all, uh, wastewater. And that's a pretty good indication that there is COVID still in the environment. Uh, the respiratory, the RSV, I try to pronounce this, and shisho virus, RSV for us. Um, these symptoms mimic the common colds, only they're much more uh, deadly. They progress quickly to severe respiratory stress. And again, seasonal flu, not going anywhere. It's still around and it will plague us forever. Again, suggestions for, for you. Revisit your standing orders because if these things really present a major problem, as um, some predict they will, you may have to exclude more readily so work with your school physician and the public health department so you have some cloud behind you when you start um, sending children home. And I, I need to throw in here, I was out there cheering for our ICU and ER nurses when they left the hospital. And I, I still don't understand how we could give such accolades to people that are um, upholding the regulations as you are. And yet so many school nurses I heard took abuse from parents and uh, because they had to send children home. Encourage, so I'm telling you now, set, continue to send children home. And I know your eyes are rolling there. You try, they don't belong in school. Keep them home if you can. Encourage age appropriate vaccines and continue to follow primary health prevention precautions. They really helped us, hand washing, masking, gloves, isolation. Um, separate uh, respiratory uh, illness, illness from the children just coming in for Band-Aids. Ventilate your office, clean surfaces. We have nothing to lose by going back to those precautions. Okay. And we're into immunizations. Um, at this time, California and Washington, D.C. require COVID for school entrance and for some sports like uh, wrestling where they have to uh, we have close contact. Medical exemptions are permitted in every state. Religious 44 and a few still permit philosophicals. Uh, I add my two cents here. Um, I certainly understand there are some people with extremely strong religious convictions. However, there are a few out there that will plead with their physicians to get a medical exemption for their child so they don't have to comply with the immunizations. 
And if the pediatrician refuses, then they seek a religious exemption because, of course, that's much easier to get. So um, anyway, be aware of that and uh, keep track of all your um, exemptions. Provide, make them available for your audits and certainly clear anything questionable with your school attorney. Okay, emergency management. I had the privilege of participating in a wonderful webinar sponsored by Mr. David Nash, Director of Legal One, along with Dr. Scambino from the New Jersey Department of Emergency Preparedness and Planning, and Dr. Zivi Marins, pediatric cardiologist, and Dr. Matthew Bolton, assistant superintendent in the Westfield School Districts. Together, they offered us the trifecta of experts. It was a marvelous uh, session, an entire day. What I've taken are just a few of the highlights from this six hour plus day. Um, I need you to bear in mind uh, what a crisis is. It's a decisive moment when extreme danger is perceived or evident, whereas um, a disaster occurs when the medical needs outstrip the available resources. In other words, a ceiling tile falls, hits a kid on the head, you've got a crisis. If the entire ceiling falls down on the entire class, then you've got a crisis because you need more than one ambulance, you need some help there. So what are you to do? Now, this was a consensus from all of them. Form a crisis team. You should have one in place. You should have one in place already. If you do not, it must be formed. You must practice drills, the prepare a go kit, and I've included in my my book, um, uh, Fast Facts, what has to be included in that go kit. You need uh, a re means of communication. You need floor plans. You need medications for children that, that might need it arrive as you're outside. And you must stay informed. Dr. Gambino told us if you, you should be told anytime there's a drill. If you're not, assume it's the real McCoy and you call, for, to, uh, you call 911 to get things started. Um, the crisis team is composed of many people, not just the school nurse and the, the principal. You need the fire department, the police department. You need the um, uh, a town administrator. You need many, many people to form a united front to handle the emergencies. And the types of crises, disasters, violence, terrorism, bioterrorism, a natural environmental hurricane, fire, explosion, illnesses. All of these are crises or, or can develop into a disaster. So what do you do about it? Okay, a doctor, um, uh, Bolton, told us at his school he used to have table drills where every way, even when they, in preparation for the regular drill, he would sit around at their table, a conference table, and discuss whose job it was to do what. Um, excellent idea. Appropriate uh, under actions to the different types of drills, we are required by law to have two a month. And what I see for the most part is most schools just have the evacuation, a fire drill. And sadly, I even have seen a few that were really not as comprehensive as they should have been, where the bathrooms were checked and stairwells are blocked and, and children are, are removed from the, the uh, class so that they could check that everyone was accounted for. Uh, you should be having an evacuation drill at least once a month. And one of these other drills, cardiac is not required, but lockdown where the perpetrator is outside the building and the door is sealed that no one can come in or leave. Drop and cover where you go to a low location in the building uh, and cover your head. I would assume that's for a bomb scare. And then shelter are in place. That's if the perpetrator is wandering through the building. And... Um, Children are to huddle in a corner and um, wait for the person to pass. Okay, all of these should be practiced as well as a cardiac drill, which Dr. Zivi Marins recommended for us. Um, I'd like to go through this very, very quickly with you as well. Because cardiac issues in school, um, we're always on the lookout. They could be on pre-participation physicals. I know it's a headache. Be strict about getting them in and getting your updates. If the physical is outside of 90 days, they should have an update from the parent that there's been no change in their health status. Now, the cardiac issues, the most common kind we see are two. The sudden cardiac death, that's usually caused by an anomaly of the heart, say, or stenosis, something like that, 
we see it mostly during uh, um, uh, heavy running sports, soccer, football, um, basketball. And then there's commotio, and that occurs one hour, within one hour of exercise. Commotio cordis is a sudden blow to the chest, and we see that in baseball. And that's when it's just a sudden stoppage of the heart. Regardless of the cause, no pulse, you start the emergency system and get your AED going. I will not go through all the specifics of Janet's law, but it does require how many AEDs per population, where they should be located, and details an action plan for you. Um, Dr. Um, Marin stressed the importance of doing drills. He said, put your best effort and money and time into AEDs and training so you can treat at the point of care. And what pops into my mind right away is the uh, incident where a football player went down on the field and everybody, they were like little robots, they ran out and I believe they had a very good success. They had that significant success with that um, with the player. Reminds me of a dear friend of ours it was a physician for some football team. And he told us that um, one hour before every game, he was expected on the field specifically to do a drill. It was no accident that they knew exactly what to do. They were trained. Okay. So we're going into a different part here now. Um, first thing I must do is congratulate each and every one of you. I am sure many of you have heard already, this is the 23rd year in a row that nurses have been identified as the most trusted profession. So with that tremendous honor, we now have responsibilities as well. We must provide a safe place for the child so it doesn't fit in. Whether it's due to uh, gender conflicts, whether it's they're mentally ill, autistic, abusive, or they're transient students and they just haven't found their place yet. Allow them to spend time with you, appropriate time, maybe during lunch, maybe after or before school, maybe during recess. Let them interact in your office. You know, if they can be comfortable in a smaller environment, it'll help them be comfortable with the larger campus. They are your students, these children that don't fit in, the marginalized ones. So sit at the table when they discuss them with the child study team. Well, bring them to the table at Child Study Team or 504. Recommend teachers that are more accepting. Advocate for them. They're your class. They're your students. And look at your own prejudice as well. It's just not enough for us to tolerate. We have to accept and work on building the self-esteem of every single child that you come in contact and I will, I will demonstrate that a little bit later in this program. Oh, and here we get I forgot. Okay, this is a brief video I'd like you to watch. I take you into my classroom. Welcome. Put it a little louder if you can. What's your name again? Lindsay. Lindsay? Lindsay, I have to tell you, I'm not kidding with you. You understand that. I understand. Lindsay, I noticed when you walked in, I know you were a little concerned and you were like, I was just happy to have you come in my class. As I'm speaking to everybody, I'm constantly paying the group and I see who's attending and who's with it. You always caught my eye. Always caught my eye. Look at you and knew that you were really paying attention. And you walked in with a puppy tail and you look so cute. You really do. Do you work out too? Because you can tell you're, you're physically fit. And you care for yourself. You, yeah. really, you do. You look great. Yeah. You look wonderful. And you're a good student. Very happy. Very happy. Okay, what I want you to do now, put your arms out at your side. And then, no matter, like this, no matter how hard I try, don't let me pull your arms down. Ready? I think so. Great. Okay, Lindsay, put your arms down now. Because I have to talk to you again. So no matter how much I no. arms down now. <laughs> arms down. Now I need to be honest with you. Did you know I did this? Yeah. And this is how you this. Came straight from work. Come on. You know it's a graduate class. You know you're dealing with nurses here. No makeup, not even lipstick, nothing, no, no blush, nothing. You just drag yourself here and you expect me to be happy to see you. And then you come late to work. Come on, who are you kidding? 
Did you ever hear of curling your hair a little bit to make yourself look a little bit presentable for me? Just a little bit? I've heard of it, yeah. I'm very disappointed in you. And if you want to withdraw, I understand, because I don't know if I want to deal with you. Put your arms out again. Don't let me pull you down. Easy sneezing. No, I'm kidding. No, I'm kidding. Now, my point is, Lindsay is an intelligent woman. I told you I was kidding with you. She knows that. Does she really care what I think of her clothes? I don't think so. Yet, get inside your head and take away your confidence, your self-esteem. It was that easy. Imagine the little kid. Imagine the little kid, five or six years old, or the kid that's already marginalized and say excluded. Imagine how that child feels when a teacher berates them. They have no confidence, no self-esteem. So I share that with you in hopes that you'll always remember. The child is uncomfortable. The child gives you the wrong answer. The child is embarrassed. You have to make that child feel good about themselves before they leave your class every single day. Even if it's just to pull them over to the side and say, listen, I think you're great. And I know you really knew the answer to that question. I know. You couldn't kid me. I know that you're very smart. Something to build that child's self-esteem. Okay? So that they, if they don't have that confidence in themselves, they can't learn. They just can't learn. You know I love you. But it was it was strange because I knew you what knew was you know what was coming. I tried it really, really hard. It works every time. time. No. I did it with my son. My son starts from everyone. We're going to do an exercise. Okay. Um and that it really does work every time. I cannot, I'm beginning to summarize here now. We have a few more uh, slides and just one more very brief video for you to see. But I can't let you leave without giving you some strategies um, to deal with a difficult situation. Child comes to you who is unhappy and needs, and needs to talk. Um, the first thing you do, of course, is assure them that you do care about them, listen to them, close that door, give them your full attention and make it crystal clear that you must share information if you feel the student is in danger from themselves or others. Offer to work with them to share information with parents. And this is with that unwanted, unwanted pregnancy with a child that's gay. They do need someone else to confide in. Um, and they may identify a close family friend or, or someone other than their parents, and you can help them there. Ideally, the parents, of course, but ask the difficult question, and this is much easier said than done. You need to ask them, have you thought about hurting yourself? Is there anyone touching you or hurting you? And, and refer immediately if you think this child is not safe, if they have suicide plans or they are being abused or you, you see that they're cutting. Do not let a child leave to go home to an unsafe environment, and you must refer them and get them professional help. Okay, um, don't carry your work home. Um, they don't pay us enough to, to, to worry about a child's uh, safety at home. Uh, to seek advice. You're not a counselor. Uh, the child will succeed if they're provided with the help and opportunities and maintain a high level of professional care. Uh, and I, I throw this in there because it's so important now that, that there's so many nurses that are being replaced with um, not someone who's not a certified nurse or um, they're reducing the, having nursing nurses cover two schools. Um, no book, no words, no workshop can replace the services of a qualified health professional such as yourself. Most of the people that make the decisions for these cuts or pullbacks, whatever they are, um, have never been in a school. And certainly uh, never been in a health office and probably never been in a school since they went themselves. Yet they're making decisions here that are, are really serious ones. Um, I need to, to stress this with you. If one devalues the role of the school nurse in the educational process, you devalue the child. And that is just not acceptable.
some closing points for you. And there's just um, one or two more, one more slide, I think, and then the video, and then one more after that will be finished. The entire school population at community is our uh, is our home, and they're, they're all our patients. The honor that we so enjoy comes responsibility. Keep informed, be part of the solution, not the problem. Be flexible, be re resilient, and above all, put common sense above everything else. Consider the needs of the child first. One more brief video, and then I will close this. Students, right now, as we uh, begin to close this webinar, I would like to do a demonstration with you that I normally do the last night of class for my introductory course, School Health Services One. Um, you may have seen variations of this. If, if so, um, I ask your patience. Otherwise, I hope you'll see the um, the purpose of this type of demonstration. This container, as you can tell, is hard. It cannot stretch. It cannot be expanded upon. That represents your day with just so many minutes in the day and so many hours that you could spend at school with students. Inside here, I have about five pounds of rice kernels, which represents all the tasks you must do. The paperwork, the endless, the logging, the reports, the 504 forms, et cetera, plus a fair amount of non-nursing tasks, as I call them, things that really could be done by other people, not necessarily a school nurse, um, things like uh, covering the main office. Um, it could be uh, doing attendance or other clerical tasks that really everybody else is too busy, so they kind of fall on your desk. So anyway, we have a limited amount of time with many, many tasks to, to, to tend to. Besides that, we're there to take care of children. Many, many children need your time and attention. This child has autism and needs to check in with you daily. This child has an anxiety disorder and needs to spend a few minutes with you before he goes into the classroom. This is the asthmatic child who arrives for a nebulizer treatment. This child has a seizure disorder and needs to be medicated and make sure the classroom's not overly hot and whatever care he needs for that day. This child's attention deficit. This child is transient just moved into the school, is lost, so has kind of been clinging to you. This is a child who played on the monkey bars and you suspect has just twisted or even broken the arm. This is a child whose parents are going through a messy divorce. These two little guys are morbidly obese and you're helping them help, uh, watch their diet. And this is the diet, the child with diabetes that you also have to help monitor. Um, these all represent a whole variety. This child incontinent. Uh, this child has a headache every day at the same time. Of course, the child with the stomach ache. Those children that are the um, uh, regular routine high flyers, we call them. Um, this child suffers with gender identity and is kind of lost and you're trying to help them find themselves. This child is woefully neglected. You help them clean up every day. As you can well see, they just do not all fit into your day. So I have a suggestion for you, my colleagues. Whether you are a new school nurse or a rookie, you don't know where to begin your day. You don't know what, what should be done first, how to do it. So I would make a very simple suggestion to you. As you begin your day, I strongly suggest Take the tasks out of your priority. Instead, put the children in first. That is the main reason you were in the school. That is the main reason that you're needed by children. Not for kids, not for other people, not to make other people's life easier. You're there for the children. And then slowly, as your day progresses, add your tasks as many as you can at time for next. And you will find that at the end of the day, 
not only have you taken care of your children, you've accomplished what you had to, and when you look at your day, you find you even have a little time left over. And with that time, ladies and gentlemen, I'm strongly suggesting go for lunch. Get away from your desk, out of your office, walk around the building, look at the trees, relax. If you have time, connect with some other colleague, other school nurse that you can share part of your day with and get some advice and offer your sage advice as well. That's what I would suggest for all of you so that you continue in school nursing because all of you have much to offer. Thank you. Students, right? Okay, my last slide here for you. Um, again, remain informed. Accept your changing paradigm. Realize that the future really does depend on us. And take care of yourself as well as you care for others. And always remember, this is my byline, children do not interrupt your work. They are your work. So thank you, thank you for joining me. Um, I look forward to your comments and we have a few minutes for questions. Yeah, thank you, Janice, for an informative and excellent presentation. And thank you everybody for all your comments in the chat, just as an FYI. We will be sharing all those uh, comments with Janice after the webinar. So um, we appreciate you taking the time to do that. We're going to go ahead and take a couple of questions um, now. So just as a reminder, please type your questions into the question box on the control panel. So um, a couple of things came in, Janice. One of them was being asked if the parents are the only ones listed for the the contact and the child gives the name of another person to be contacted, how do we determine that the person they ask us to contact is a self a safe person, especially with so much sexual abuse and human trafficking going on? How do we determine that? If I have to point out right away, if there's um, suspected sexual abuse in any way, then you're not contacting parents, you're not contacting, uh, contacting anyone other than protective services. They take it from there. <laughs> you call them in uh, as soon as they arrive at the building, you insist on seeing their, their identification. You remain with the child, you keep that child on, on, your, on your lap. If it's a little one, you keep them close to you so that they know that you're there to support them. But I would not call parents. I would not call anyone else other than protective services. They have their protocols that they follow. And now if the child wants, if it's a situation where the child suspects they're pregnant um, and they do not want the parent to know right away and it's a family friend, you ask what the relationship is, then I would call that other person. I would. Um, as long as the, the uh, person can identify them and there's no question about abuse in any way. Did I answer that correctly? <laughs> did I answer that the way it was written? Yes, you did. Actually, if you can switch to the next slide, because we only have a couple minutes left, I wanted to let people know about the, the certificate as well. But um, what? Oh, you want me to? I'm yeah, sorry. if you can switch yeah. to the next slide, Janice, that would be great. That's okay. Um, there are the references and there it is. Okay. Um, and then the other question that came in was what are people who don't, I, what are people who are, don't identify as male or female? What are they? They're non-binary. Yeah. Okay. They don't identify. And again, this is another theory. There are some that still believe that it's, that it's, uh, that they're male and female. And this new movement now said that they're non-binary that they can be that it's almost like a spectrum that they identify at some point along that spectrum not necessarily all with male or with female okay and i'm going to take one more question from the q a i know we're almost at the hour so before people leave just a reminder thank you again to school nurse supply and as you see here if you buy a copy of fast facts book from school nurse supply uh, you will receive a free spiral notebook with your name on it. And as we mentioned, all attendees will receive a certificate of attendance for uh, from Springer Publishing for one hour within a couple of weeks post-webinar. 
Um, this webinar is being recorded. Several people asked about the webinar being recorded and you all will be receiving it as will anybody who has registered for it. So we certainly are thrilled if you want to share this with people. Um, Janice, the last question is, how do you balance being helpful and available to students without getting overwhelmed with non-health tasks? So much of our nurses' days now are consumed with shoe tying, belt repair, et cetera. Absolutely. Isn't that, isn't that say it? I, I totally agree. I don't mind the shoe tying as much as if it deta you know, if it involves a student, um, his direct need or whatever. I used to resent the um, uh, covering uh, the office or a teacher that was late or um, uh, doing attendance. I, I found that uh, if if we did things not because nobody else could do it, it was because nobody else would do it. Um, you know what? You have to say no. You know, when, when you get to that point where you're really feeling abused, just say, I'm so sorry, I can't help you. That's it. There's that. And you say that to the adults, not to the child. Um, the child, that's why you're there. You have to do that for them. That, that's great. Um, well, I, we're at the hour, so it looks like we've covered all of our questions. I want to thank everyone for spending time with us today. And thank you again to Janice for an amazing presentation. As I mentioned before, if you're interested in purchasing either of Janice's books, you can uh, go to the School Nurse Supply website and use the discount code webinar to receive your special gift with purchase. In addition, you will receive an email actually sooner within the next week regarding the certificate of attendance. And finally, the recorded session will be available on springerpop.com within five to seven business days. We wanna wish everyone a great afternoon and we look forward to you joining us for future Springer Publishing webinars. Thanks again and have a great day.